welcome to our fourth Sunday Salon, and I believe our 12th class of fellows, is that what it is? Um, this extraordinary program, the, the Cole Fellows, um, has brought such amazing people to our site. We have been so lucky to have really talented, fresh out of their academic programs with so many ideas and so much education and just a fresh way of seeing everything that we do. And in turn, we like to give them everything we've got and train them on how to be museum professionals and give them networking, give them hands-on experience in everything that we do. So we all benefit from each other. It's just the most wonderful program. So I'm thrilled to present this program to you today. Um, so the person who has really made this program what it is, is our curator, Kate Ben Canary, who has, is this your 11th year with us? So. Yeah, Kate. Um, we we're so lucky that you came to us. I mean, we had no idea. I knew you were talented and smart and capable as a curator, but you've just done so much more than we ever could have imagined. Um, this fellows program being part of it. Uh, really shaped it and made it what it is. So please welcome Kate McKinnery. Thank you, Betsy. That's so sweet. Um, thank you. I would just like to thank everybody for coming today. And it's so great to see everybody out here. Um, that was such a beautiful introduction. Thank you, Betsy. How many of you have been here to listen to the fellows talk? before? Yes, a lot of you. Okay, that's fantastic. Well, you're in for a treat, and um, it's really an honor and a joy to be able to present and introduce Beth, Sophia, and Kristen today. They've been working with us on um, welcoming visitors, on our exhibitions. They created new collection displays and interpretation displays in the house. They worked with over 20 scholars to create what's going to be the first book of our collection. Um, and I think that you all have um, really, the research they've conducted this year is some of the most important and urgent research that's ever happened at our site. So you're in for a treat. And I want to thank um, you all for all of the work you've done throughout the year. Um, this group stands out because they are brilliant and sophisticated. They are really kind and thoughtful and open and deeply respected, or sort of respectful of each other and of other ideas. Um, and that'll come through in their research when they talk with you about it. But they're also fierce and determined <laughs> and visionary. And so I just want to thank you for the courage and the imagination and the intelligence that you bring to everything you do. It's really been an honor to work with you this year. And I also want to take the time to thank all of our staff and our board, and uh, many of you who are actually here today, John, Sylvia, so many of you have been an important part of our conversations and this program all year, so um, thank you for being such an important part of it. And I especially want to thank Warner Shook, who works with the fellows all year on this presentation. Um, so it's you're in for a treat again, but um, it's really a gift that extends far beyond today. So thank you, Warner. Um, each presentation is going to be about 15 minutes long, so please hold your questions until after. Um, and without further ado, I'm very pleased to bring up Beth Nguyen. today. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm really excited to kick us off this afternoon. There we go. Okay, my presentation today is titled Cedar Grove Foundations, Demerara Exploits and Catskill Beginnings. When I first came to the Thomas School National Historic Site and came to the main house, I was struck by the large porch the periwinkle color of the walls in the front entryway and the painted borders attributed to Thomas Cole. 
Within the yellow bricks and large planks of wood, beyond the windows outlooking the Catskill Mountains, there is a history that fractures this description of beauty, one that begins with funds amassed during the transatlantic slave trade by property owner Thomas Thompson. Thomas Thompson was the uncle of Mariah Bartow Cole, who came to marry Thomas Cole. It is the Thompson and Bartow families who owned the historic property during Thomas Cole's residency. At an early age, Thomas Thompson and his brother John Alexander, who some of you might know as Uncle Sandy, were taught the value of trade and mercantile by their father, Dr. Thomas Thompson. Okay, from 1804 to 1815, Thomas Thompson spends approximately 10 years in a region of South America called Demerara, one of the most active places of enslavement and the trading of people and high profit goods in the transatlantic. Demerara today is uh, part of present day Guyana, um, and this is where we're sort of situated in respect to it. Some of you might be familiar with Demerara sugar, which was one of the largest exports that came out of this region and was then harvested and grown entirely by enslaved people. This is what those two places look like today. People enslaved in Demerara and the surrounding Caribbean islands harvested massive crops of tobacco and sugar cane, which were then turned into the products of molasses, commercial sugar, and rum. This was the economy of the transatlantic slave trade. All of these and more Thomas Thompson sold and traded. Several people were enslaved by Thomas Thompson at his Demerara estate and countless others in his inherent participation of the triangular market. This is a list of uh, all of the people enslaved by the Thompson family between uh, roughly the years of the late 1700s into uh, 1820. All of these people, excepting Abigail Josephus Thompson, who you will get to hear a, a bit about later by my co-fellow Sophia, um, Caesar, Bill, and Chloe, were individuals enslaved in South America by the family. Um, and for the purpose of today, I'll most, mostly be talking about them, um, but all of them deserve their due and recognition. This research is ongoing, and an attempt to identify the descendants of these individuals is an essential part of this research and the continuation of it. There are individuals who are not named, but instead who were reduced to numbers and their occupational roles. In 1809, 18 people, including children, were enslaved by Thomas Thompson and listed in a statement of his revenue for the year. People were listed as revenue. Two men, a stone sawyer and a domestic servant, were advertised for sale at Thompson's storefront where he sold colonial housewares on the grounds of a plantation called Blissingen, um, which is a Dutch word that translates to flushing in English. The grounds that today are home to a botanical garden. This was a store that was also run by uh, the last name on this list, Priscilla Mary Thompson. There are no known portraits of Priscilla Mary, um, but her words come through in letters addressed to Thomas Thompson. The next few slides you'll see are from an Italian painter named Agostino Brunius, who um, whose subjects were mostly free and enslaved women of color, um, lots of Creole fashion, and um, images of the planter class. We should look at these with a critical eye, as Bernius was creating a rather sanitized version of slavery, um, but the attention to dress and the commercial and market activities of communities of color in his paintings is significant. Priscilla Mary Thompson was a saleswoman who conducted considerable shop affairs alongside Thomas Thompson. She was an enslaved woman herself and held a 10-year relationship with Thomas Thompson that was considered to be a common law marriage, meaning this very likely wasn't a ceremonial union, but their relationship was at least tolerated in the Dutch territory of Demerara. 
The question of a consensual and fair relationship existing between the two of them should, of course, always be considered. Priscilla Mary and Thomas Thompson had five children together. Their names were George Washington, James Madison, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and Helen. Sound familiar? <laughs> their children were likely born enslaved by their own father. Priscilla Mary's participation in the market culture of Demerara is significant and helps to frame an understanding of her social position and material experience as an enterprising woman of color. Priscilla advertised in the local paper, the Demerara and Essequibo Gazette, where she listed a stock of waistcoat patterns, black silk stockings, children's cradles, shoes that were advertised um, specifically for white children and those for black children, candles, matchsticks, pen knives, the list goes on. She held a managerial role at their household estate in Demerara, most likely directing their household staff, uh, whose names were Polly, Linda, Tony, Chloe, and Eliza. Um, they, these were all enslaved women and young boys. Eventually, George and James are sent to Liverpool to receive a formal education at the request of their father. It's uncertain if Priscilla Mary actually joined in this venture, but it is from Liverpool that Thomas Thompson departs to return to New York after living with a disease that is quickly worsening. In his departure, he requests that the people enslaved by him at his Demerara estate be sold elsewhere. This is distinct in that he is not freeing these people, um, but he leaves the shop and Demerara estate into the hands of Priscilla Mary. A letter from two facilitators of Thomas Thompson's Demerara estate uh, read, I have nothing new to communicate with regard to your affairs unless it is that the proper colonial certificate signed by the government and court is at length obtained from the secretary's office relative to Priscilla Mary's manumission, declaring her and her children legally enfranchised, meaning they're receiving their emancipation, which sets that matter at rest. Thomas Thompson arrives back in Catskill, greeted by family and friends, carrying with him 10 years of his affairs many of which are seemingly a secret. In one of their last recorded letters, Priscilla Mary writes, we are all here looking and wishing to see you every day and very anxious to hear from you. If we are not to have the pleasure of seeing you soon, your absence, children's, make things very different to me in comparison to what they formerly were. I find myself very lonesome. How do these words echo in the main house today? Let's come back up to Catskill to this place um, right below our feet. Where do the grounds of the Thomas Cole National Historic Site stand in this history? To be sure, it is the money that Thomas Thompson settles in his departure from Demerara and the money earned along the way that ensures the building of the main house. The history of labor in this structure is important and it's my hope that through this research, we can continue to acknowledge the legacy of laborers that worked the grounds, whose labor was exploited in order to finance the home, and those who laid and forged the materials of its foundation. Last year, I was lucky enough to do um, some part-time research for the site where I picked up on a project started by 2021 Cole Fellow, a dozen deco, on a free black woman who lived in the home during Thomas Cole's residency. We are still in search of her name, and as I comb through the records, trying to find mention of her and other domestic workers and farmhands, I was struck by how difficult it was to identify them, especially people who were not working in a specific trade. And then I saw a handful of names, P. Dedrick, Nixon, Tyler, Dennis Wright, were listed in a ledger from 1812 as being paid for labor. And I wondered, were these individuals later involved in the building of the 1815 main house? 
The building of the main house opens up a necessary conversation about the harmful definitions of skilled versus unskilled labor. In the years prior to its initiation, John Alexander, or Uncle Sandy, is preparing the property for pasture, hiring many farmhands to do so while his brother is still engaged in Demerara. <clears throat> it was mostly white craftsmen who are recorded and paid for blacksmithing, carpentry, and masonry, trades considered to be skilled work, meaning work that is profitable um, and can be marketed. John Alexander sought the work of well-established men like Francis Sayer and Peter Breasted to paint several surfaces of the home. Breasted um, had a paint store down on, on Main Street in Catskill in 1821, and he was considered a glazier, meaning he was a person whose profession was fitting glass into windows and doors. To imagine that this person might have actually inserted the glass panes that we see looking out the Catskill Mountains is astonishing. If this research has taught me anything, it's that there are histories always outside of the margins and people who are not given their due. Nixon and Philip Foote were two black laborers who were also paid for their labor. There were no uh, certain and definable tasks assigned to their receipts, but their names are there and they are often repeated and their work was undeniably important. This is a receipt um, from John Alexander Thompson to Philip Foote, who was, uh, from census records, we can tell he was a long time uh, Catskill resident. <coughs> Philip Foote, um, you see his signature with a little X mark around it, meaning that he might not have been able to read or write. Okay, and now I come to the really amazing brick foundation of the main house. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk very briefly about the history of brick making in the Hudson Valley. It was said that the bricks of the main house were salvaged from the home of Dr. Thomas Thompson, father of Thomas John Alexander and Catherine Thompson, meaning they could date as far back as the late 1700s. It was often the hands of enslaved people who created these early bricks. Before more industrial measures were taken, the act of tempering the clay in order to properly mold it into a rectangular shape was done either by the hooves of oxen or the hands and feet of people. Oftentimes, these were also children. The possibility of the bricks in the main house being created by enslaved laborers is significant. Um, this image, image here is um, from another Hudson Valley site, um, but I thought it was really helpful. So now there is this home, and it's comfortable and beautiful and bright. The success of Thomas Thompson's business exploits in Demerara would grant him enough financial security to secure his Catskill family, and distinctively not that of his Demerara family, the comfort of a country dwelling with generous acres and orchards overlooking the Catskill Mountains. In the years following, Thomas Thompson continues to conduct business in Catskill. He would take a master bedroom suite on the upper floor of the main house, and for those of you who have been inside, we now interpret that room as the sitting room. And this is precisely, um, presumably, the same space he would spend the rest of his life uh, afflicted by an aggressive disease that rendered painful sores on his face, likened to leprosy. Um, but this was very possibly a very aggressive case of syphilis. Thomas Thompson dies in 1821. Four years later, Thomas Cole makes his first visit to the Catskills the home carrying an idyllic safety net for the artist. In 1833, Priscilla Mary Thompson sues the estate of Thomas Thompson for the board, education, and care of their five children between the years of 1804 to 1814. Her lawsuit comes after the Demerara Rebellion of 1823 when tens of thousands of enslaved people attempt to overthrow the British colonizers. 
Priscilla Mary is personally awarded about a quarter of her request, um, the rest of the money going towards legal fees. And this likens to about $43,000 today, um, of which Thomas Thompson probably had a lot more money. Uncle Sandy is the one who settles the matter, matters of this lawsuit. Whether or not Priscilla Mary and her children were known to their Catskill in-laws is a mystery, but they were largely absented from the Catskill narrative. Related to this research are efforts to acknowledge other absented persons and the legacy of enslavement and indentured servitude that continued up into the years of Thomas Cole's residency. I have worked um, very closely uh, with the Whole History Initiative on site, which seeks to acknowledge all the many other people who were living and laboring on the property, um, surprisingly not just Thomas Cole. This year, we are intervening John Alexander Thompson's chair with manumission documents for the individuals Chloe, Bill, Josephus, and Caesar that were signed by Uncle Sandy, his sister Catherine, and brother Thomas. This includes sharing the history of the free black woman who lived in the home during Cole's residency, asking questions of her life and other laborers through a housewife display uh, such as what anti-black laws were happening at the time, what was nature like to the other people who were living and laboring here, and whose hands were providing the clear view of the windows Cole looked out to render scenes of the Catskills. This also includes unveiling a space at the foot of the stairs uh, in the basement story that included the sparse items of one cot bed and curtains one table and one mat on the floor, which we have interpreted as a space where someone who may have labored in the home slept. Okay. This research has made me think about every space that I enter now. How was it built? Who built it? And how did it get there? To borrow the words of Alon Cook Lee, who held a 2021 um, Sunday salon for us called repair work centering black humanity at historic sites. Really great, great talk. She says historic sites cannot be neutral. So what does it mean when something considered to be beautiful is without a study of its wealth, without a study of the many people who lived inside of it and the people who couldn't enter? Thank you. omitted from our histories, but I would like to remedy that. Over the past year, I have conducted primary research on Sarah Cole, a professional artist known for her paintings, drawings, and etchings. Like her brother Thomas, Sarah Cole worked, was a Hudson River School artist who worked in the movement's earliest years. This year, I transcribed Sarah's known letters, researched her paintings, and combed the historical archives to establish a better understanding of this remarkable artist working in mid 19th century New York. As a woman starting out my own career in the arts, I was particularly drawn to researching Sarah Cole, who worked at a time when there were far fewer professional opportunities for women. Past scholarship on Sarah Cole's life and career is scant, and there is still much to uncover. I hope to expand the canon of the Hudson River School to include one of its earliest members, a woman who sold and exhibited her work in the same exhibitions as other leading artists of her time. Sarah Cole was born in 1805 in Bolton-Lamorris, Lancashire, England. 
She was the youngest of James and Mary Holloway Cole's eight children. When Sarah was 13, she immigrated to the United States with her parents, her aunts, and her siblings, Mary, Anne, and Thomas. After living briefly in Pennsylvania and Ohio, the family moved to New York City, where Sarah would spend the next 23 years living primarily with her parents, her aunts, and her sister Anne's family. By the year 1837, Sarah had begun her painting career and regularly exchanged letters with her brother Thomas about painting subjects and techniques. In this letter from 1837, Sarah writes to Thomas about some of her difficulties while painting. She laments, my rocks look soft, as though you could cut them to pieces with your pen knife, and my sky looks as though it was made of metal. I will write again when I have finished, and let you know how it pleases the connoisseurs. Despite these challenges, Sarah persisted in her painting career, and even went on to learn how to make etchings from American artist Asher B. Durand. Throughout their lives, Sarah and Thomas Cole were close confidants, and Sarah wrote Thomas with advice on matters of art and life. While living in New York City, Sarah was exposed to a wealth of contemporary art and exhibitions that she described to her brother, who was then living in Catskill. In a letter from 1836, Sarah encourages Thomas in a moment of doubt about his artwork. She writes as only a fellow painter could. In a little while, you will find that the art will return to you and that you will return to the art with renewed pleasure. The lights of this life are like the lights and shadows in your own pictures. The one makes the other more beautiful. Although artist organizations and institutions were still almost completely male-dominated, professional opportunities in the arts were expanding for women in New York City, as social, political, and economic factors, including the Industrial Revolution, sparked more democratic attitudes towards art production. For instance, the National Academy of Design's Antique School began admitting women students in the year 1831, and the miniaturist painter Anne Hall became the first woman to be elected a member and academician of the National Academy in 1833. We know that Sarah Cole visited the American Art Union and the National Academy of Design, where she would have seen the artwork of influential artists such as Asher B. Durand and Daniel Huntington. In the 1840s and 1850s, Sarah would exhibit her own artwork at the American Art Union and the National Academy, as well as the Maryland Historical Society in Baltimore. So here on the screen, you see two 19th century drawings, um, the one on the left of the exhibition spaces at the American Art Union, and on the right, the exterior of the Maryland Historical Society in Baltimore. And these were two of the venues where Sarah exhibited and sold artwork. After Thomas died in 1848, Sarah left New York City to live periodically here at, here at Cedar Grove in Catskill and in Baltimore with her sister Mary's family. Studying Sarah while in residence here at the Thomas Cole National Historic Site has been ideal. The Cole site owns five works by or attributed to Sarah Cole, and the majority of her known letters are housed just a half hour away at the Albany Institute of History and Art and the New York City Library. It has been incredible to lead tours of the space where Sarah lives and made artwork, and exciting to imagine she and Thomas on hiking expeditions in the Catskills. Over the course of her career, Sarah reproduced numerous paintings by her brother Thomas, likely as part of her artistic training and as a means of producing saleable works of art. Sarah copied Thomas's A View of the Catskill Mountain House in 1848. You see Thomas Cole's original work on the left and Sarah's on the right here. Sarah copied the original painting with astonishing accuracy, capturing each detail in Thomas's painting down to the branches on the trees to the carriage tracks in the dirt road. You may notice that Sarah's painting is a little lighter than Thomas's. She has a lower contrast and more pastel hues, as is characteristic of her style. 
Previous scholars have described Sarah Cole as exclusively a copyist of Thomas Cole, but I would argue that this is an incomplete assessment. Sarah did copy numerous works by Thomas throughout her career, and she often integrated elements from his works into her own. However, Sarah also made numerous original works, one of which she refers to in a letter from 1837 as a Little Sunset original. A case study of Sarah's painting subject matter and technique is Landscape with Church. An original work owned by the Cole site and produced around the year 1846. The painting exhibits many of the formal characteristics of the Hudson River School, from autumnal foliage to sloping mountains in the distance, a horizon line placed two thirds of the canvas, and a lone figure in the foreground walking, walking stick in hand. Um, past scholarship suggests that. This scene is in fact not of the Hudson Valley, but rather of the English countryside, where Sarah spent the first 13 years of her life. The focal point of this composition is a small white church in the center of the work, um, which past researchers have posited is Duffield Church in Derbyshire, England, which is where Sarah's parents married. Another painting by Sarah to incorporate original elements is Mount Etna, a work she produced around the year 18, 1846 to 52. The painting is similar to Thomas's paintings of Mount Etna, an active volcano on the Sicilian coast, but to our knowledge, Sarah's composition and color choices speak to an original perspective. Sarah includes unique elements such as a cloaked female figure walking down a red dirt path toward the viewer, and a classical altar on the left with a fresco painting of a smiling angel or Madonna. Researching Sarah's work is an ongoing process. This year, I have tracked down additional artworks and researched the provenances of works that have been historically connected to Sarah Cole. The following slides contain our full list at this moment of works by or attributed to Sarah. Not only was Sarah Cole a painter, she was also considered one of the first women in the United States to make etchings. In 1837, Sarah wrote to Thomas, I think you had better bring down the copper plates and etching apparatus when you come, and we will talk things over and decide upon what I had better pursue. Sarah went on to learn how to make etchings from her famed contemporary Asher B. Durant. Part of her training likely inc included copying etchings and engravings by other artists. The untitled drawing that you see on the screen is a pen and ink reproduction that Sarah made of a copper engraving by French artist Jean Mathieu. In 1888, Sarah was the only artist to be posthumously featured in the New York Union League Club's exhibition catalog, Work of the Women Etchers of America where she was described as the first female etcher in the United States. In the later 19th century, a revival in etching occurred in the country, and many women artists took up the medium, including Mary Cassatt. Unfortunately, Sarah Cole's etchings never made it to the actual exhibition at the Union League Club. 
John M. Falconer, the owner of Sarah's plates and appeared to her in her lifetime, never submitted prints of the plates. To this day, we have yet to locate Falconer's plates or any etchings for that matter by Sarah Cole. In 1857, Sarah Cole passed away in Catskill at the age of 52. She was buried in town and her grave stands today in Catskill Town Cemetery next to the graves of Thomas Cole and her extended family members. Although Sarah exhibited her work in the leading exhibitions of her time and pioneered the women etchers in Hudson River School movements, her work and legacy has been largely omitted from our histories. And the forthcoming exhibition catalog, Women Reframe American Landscape, Susie Barstow and her circle of contemporary practices, art historian and curator Nancy Siegel describes how prominent women artists of the Hudson River School were left out of 20th century publications and exhibitions through what she terms an unexplainable moment of art historical amnesia. Gender bias has certainly continued in art historical studies, but scholars like Nancy Siegel, Betty J. Blum, Rowan Dean and Virginia Anderson have worked to rectify this art historical erasure. As I start out my own career in art history, it is important for me to shed light on an accomplished artist who helped pave the way for generations of women painters, etchers, and Cole Fellows. Over the past year as a fellow, I have had the opportunity to directly contribute to the site's 2023 Women, Land, and Art Initiative by designing museum displays on Mariah Bartow Cole and Sarah Cole, transcribing and publishing Mariah Cole's journal and note letters, revising and leading the Feminist Guide to Cedar Grove tour, and serving as a curatorial assistant in the upcoming exhibition, Women Reframe American Landscape. When I lead tours of the Cole site and introduce visitors to Sarah Cole's artwork, I like to imagine that Sarah is standing by on my tour, listening to her story be told. Keep an eye out for Sarah Cole and the upcoming exhibition opening May 6th, as well as in new museum displays. For the first time in the site's history, the exhibition will show five works by or attributed to Sarah Cole. Thank you so much for listening.
When Cole first took his steamboat journey up the Hudson River in 1825 to explore and sketch the wild wonders of the Hudson Valley, in nearby Athens there lived a mixed race, recently emancipated black man who was beginning to make a free life for himself. He was intimately connected to Cole's soon-to-be in-laws and contributor to their prosperity. My time at the Thomas Cole site has centered on contemplating the outer and inner life of this man, whose name, as it appears in 1820s local census, is Josephus Thompson. His experience matters on multiple levels, but perhaps most broadly as a case study for 19th century black life in the Hudson Valley. In a similar ethos, I also want to acknowledge that research is never done alone is always the result of collaboration, consultation, and a practice of generous intellectual sharing. This project is made possible through the consultation of Sylvia Hassenkopf, who is here, uh, John Palmer, who is also here, uh, and numerous others on our site who have shared so generously their materials and their expertise. Josephus' story is the result of numerous finds that I simply want to piece together and bring forward. In Josephus' narrative, we also witness the great conundrum of what to do or construct in the gaps of historical record, which so often intentionally write out enslaved figures. Within these limits, writer Sadia Hartman champions a practice called critical fabulation as a strategy to go beyond the limits of the archive through informed speculation. To put a face to a name, this is an image of a Jamaican enslaved man who led a similar life to that of Josephus. Using a speculative image for Josephus to me is part of a humanizing project of visibility and gives him the potential to appear before us embodied in some speculative way. To me, it's also a devastating truth that to understand Josephus' life means we also have to evoke him through the documents that marked him as owned and enslaved. What are we doing when we evoke the name of the Thompsons? It's in many ways a tragedy that to recall the enslaved who have so few identifying records we also must recall the perpetrators and bring them to life again as well. So Josephus first emerges from the archive through a handwritten bill of sale from 1797, stating that a three-year-old boy, a uh, slave named Josephus, or Cephas for short, is being sold and transferred from Dr. Thomas Thompson, father of the Thompson siblings, Thomas, Catherine, and John Alexander, or Uncle Sandy, the original owners of the Cedar Grove home, to his son, Thomas Thompson. This places Josephus' approximate year of birth around 1794. It's highly unusual that Thomas Thompson, at 19 years old, is inheriting a three-year-old child, before Thompson is even considered legally adult at 25. It's a possibility, then, that Josephus is related by blood to the family, perhaps even Thomas Thompson's own son. A 1790 census lists Dr. Thompson's family as already living in Catskill with four enslaved persons. This is also the first known mention of the Thompson family as enslavers. Josephus's bill of sale notes that he is born of Dr. Thompson's wench, Abigail, and then presumably lived with his enslavers, the Thompson family in Catskill. Interestingly, the document ends with the phrase, to have and to hold. Not long after, the New York State Manumission Act of 1799 is passed, with a final period of emancipation not set until uh, 1827. However, all those born before 1799 were considered enslaved for life. According to this piece of legislation, Josephus and indeed most of those whom the, the Thompson family enslaved would have never been owed their freedom. On August 30th, 1804, an official document is signed marking Josephus as enslaved and enabling him to travel with Thomas Thompson. It describes him as Cephas, a mulatto boy about the age of 11 years, fat, full fair, is born at Catskill in the county of Green in the state of New York. That the paid mulatto boy Cephas is a slave in the property of Thomas T. Thompson. A little over three months later, in December, on December 14, 1804, Josephus travels to Denver, presumably with Thomas Thompson. We know from Beth's research what this period of time then entailed. By 1811, a Demerara Royal Gazette includes a posting that indicates that Thomas Thompson is suddenly offering his Demerara home and business up for sale, likely sensing the building tensions that would result in the Demerara Revolution of 1823. Then in 1814, we find ship records in which Josephus has departed to the United States with Thomas Thompson on a ship called the Gertrude. The record describes 
Alien's name and description, Joe, a native of New York, five feet, seven inches, black hair, mulatto complexion, dark eyes, age 19. Profession, servant to Mr. Thompson, to whom known, no person here. From this document, we get some of the first physical details of who Josephus was. Josephus was young, only about 19, while he traveled across multiple continents. He was also tall, and in fact towered over Thomas Thompson, who, on his ship record, stands at only five foot one at 35 years old. I like to think of how they may have appeared together. <laughs> he also signs the ticket with an X, surrounded by his mark, indicating that he may not have been able to write. In mid-April, in 1816, Thomas Thompson writes to his brother, John Alexander, who we know now as Uncle Sandy from New York, asking him to write when the Cedar Grove house will be ready to move into. Then, in August of 1816, Uncle Sandy writes a receipt in Catskill to cutting Josephus one pair of pantaloon. Josephus must now be on the property with the rest of the Thompsons. Half a year later, an 1817 Catskill Village census confirms that Cedar Grove consists of eight white persons, two free black persons, and two enslaved persons. I believe one of these enslaved persons is Josephus. In the same year, local newspapers like the Catskill Recorder are regularly reporting kidnappings of black persons, a fear which surely gripped Josephus and Catskill's larger black community. Also that year in Catskill, in 1817, there are 66 free people of color and 13 people who are still enslaved. Josephus is still one of those 13. Then that same year, the Gradual Emancipation Law of 1817 is passed in New York, declaring that any enslaved person born before 1799 would now become free in 1827. With all the rest, prior to 1817, Josephus was likely expected to live out his entire life enslaved. But then finally, after spending nearly all of his life in servitude, Josephus receives his freedom at around 24 years old as a gift on Christmas Day in 1818. By the 1820s, Uncle Sandy's household totals at 14, and for the first time with no enslaved persons. The same Greene County census, remarkably, also includes a Josephus Thompson listed as a free black man living in Athens and head of household. Only about six miles from the coal house, if he continued to work for or have relationships with Catskillians, he could have walked back to Catskill in about an hour. Then, another interesting piece of census. On a continuation of the 1820 census, a Joseph Thompson appears with several other tick marks indicating other household members who are also free black persons. If this is indeed Josephus with a name misspelling and double listed, like these come together with other black community members for safety and support. The very last mention we have of Josephus in our record so far comes from an 1862 book titled Reminiscences of Catskill by James Pinckney. In it, he describes Josephus and another enslaved person named Caesar accompanying Thomas Thompson to a fraternity meeting called the Harmony Lodge. Pinckney writes, uh, next comes the name of Thomas Thompson he went accompanied by two faithful servants, Josephus, Josephus and Caesar, then slaves, and for long years remained abroad. This is kind of the, the juicy bit. Um, <laughs> his West Indian life had been a mystery which the curious hoped his death would solve, but they were disappointed, and then they built fresh hopes upon his faithful body servants who had accompanied him through all his wanderings, and were supposed to have possessed his fullest confidence. But Josephus was reserved and taciturn, with whom a secret, involving even life itself, might be safely confided. He survived his master many years, and at last died suddenly, cheating the quid monks or the gossips out of the awful disclosures of which they had so long lived in marvelous anticipation. <laughs> Though we have no information yet on when or how it happened, this is the first recording I've come across of Josephus' death. We can gather from this description how intimately connected Josephus was to Thomas Thompson's business, personal life, and exploits. He was a confidant who held immense and mysterious knowledge. He was privy to Thomas Thompson's dealing in the enslavement of others. Josephus experienced a racializing across multiple continents. We also know from this entry that Josephus survives Thomas Thompson by several years. I've spent so much time wondering what these years were like for him. 
As I stated at the beginning of this journey, it's a tragedy that to evoke Josephus, we must also evoke the systems of enslavement that he navigated. We have no words, ideas, or anecdotes of his own. But this doesn't stop me from imagining Josephus' life waste. This image is an 1861 etching of an enslaved servant in Baltimore who may have labored in a comparable way to Josephus. I like to think of Josephus as a tall, strong, well-spoken man with a powerful presence. He would have been Thompson's right-hand man, helping him with daily life and making it more comfortable. He might have risen in the morning very early before anyone else to take care of Thompson and his households. In fact, washing, shaving, and clothing Thompson himself. He might have turned down the beds, made the fires, mended the clothes, gathered the mail, greeted Thompson's visitors, and accompanied Thompson wherever he went. As I've gathered from reading and consultation, as a manservant, Josephus would have been at the top of the pecking order in terms of the Thompson's enslaved population, having a good deal of autonomy and responsibility. As a servant, Josephus, of, Josephus would have also been chiefly caring for the sick and dying Thomas Thompson. In his book, Reminiscences of Catskill, James Pinckney remembers Thomas Thompson as a man whom, for all his reputed wealth, I would not have exchanged places for a day. Broken in constitution and afflicted with a disease, said to be leprosy, it seemed to me, as he took his accustomed ride every morning, muffled to the eyes to conceal the marks of his malady. People in the day supposed this was leprosy, but given that Thomas Thompson was non-contagious, it is more likely syphilis which was one of the most prolific diseases of the time. I can only imagine what kind of intimate or grisly medical care Josephus would have been giving in his care for Thomas Thompson. So by the time Thomas Cole takes his first steamboat trip up the Hudson River in 1825, it's likely that Josephus, who was so intimately connected to Cole's future in-laws, was living nearby, just beginning his free life. I hope deeply that he found community and joy in those years. So why does Josephus matter so much to me in my study of Thomas Cole's life and work? The truth is, I think about figures like Josephus whenever I look at a painting in a fanciful gold frame. To me, stories like Josephus's are ultimately connected to the flourishing of art and culture in all Western nations. His story is part of a larger scenario that made Cole's artistic career possible, as we know from Beth's research of how Cedar Grove's home was uh, financed. With no such fortune, and on the opposite side of a system that made so many families like the Thompsons intergenerationally wealthy, what were the free black individuals in the Hudson Valley able to accomplish despite their circumstances? They might be resurgent accomplishments of human will, community, and spirit. <clears throat> I've also spent a good deal of time thinking about what to do with these names like Josephus and the others of the Thompson family enslaved. And one of those possibilities is in the spirit of Cole as an artist in commissioning an art installation for the site that memorializes and makes public its history of enslavement. I can think of no better artist for this than John Mark Superville Sovac, <laughs> uh, who is uh, right here in the photograph. <laughs> and he's a, a local multidisciplinary artist and teaching professional and a friend of the Cole site whose work is deeply rooted in the community around him restorative justice and remediation. And not only has his work dealt in 19th century landscape images here, for instance, with the insertion of abolitionist imagery, but also in public installation. Oops, sorry. Um, like this one here, uh, which is at the Jamestown Arts Center. And it's titled Six of the First. It's a laser cut steel work that makes known the names of six early enslaved figures in Rhode Island and brings forward the state's dark history as a triangular trade stop that trafficked in enslaved bodies. So for me, it's strange to think that uh, in so much of Cole's work, we might see a small and occasional indigenous figure uh, represented, but not a single black figure, though he would have been interacting with black Americans on a regular basis. This is a figure study that Cole uh, did that seems to depict figures doing manual labor. Um, it's the closest I've seen of Cole depicting a laboring class. For someone concerned mostly with the aesthetic, his reticence on social causes or the pressing issue of slavery is telling. I wonder if Thomas Cole and Josephus may have even met. In this work, I want to make a point of considering the marginalized others 
and their labors in the making of modernity and the culture of taste. From the 19th century to today, I want us to recognize the ways in which oppression has existed so that we might hold the possibilities for joy instead. Thank you. history of agriculture and like farm to table living and I think it would be amazing to continue researching um, agricultural workers who worked on site and um, we have some wonderful greening initiatives in place already so maybe like pairing that history with um, our environmental history would be I think really important and um, yeah just keep giving people their due. Yeah, that's a good answer. Yeah, and a lot of it's <laughs> a new top. I mean, a lot of it's being done too in this year alone with the tours that are expanding, the displays that um, the whole team really has been working on. Um, yeah, and with the new visitor center, I think also that's coming. There's a lot of good educational potential there as well. You know, libraries dedicated to Black history, the Hudson Valley. You know, to women artists in the 19th century. Um, sharing resources openly, having the names be public, you know. I really do think a, a public art installation would be great that memorializes people. Um, yeah, and then also, yeah, we have a, we do have a land acknowledgement. I'm also working actively right now on a, on a labor acknowledgement and an acknowledgement of the site's kind of history of enslavement. So hopefully making that public uh, as well, too. Yeah. Did you want to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to 
like to echo what Warner had to say. Thank you so much for helping bring this to life. It's so important. You did a wonderful job. My question is about Sarah uh, Cole. Can you talk a little bit uh, more about what you found in terms of her feelings of struggling to be a woman artist in a time that didn't respect women? And if she felt, or if Thomas Cole ever expressed anything about that, her frustrations, I mean, did, where did she find support? Um, what were her gripes, so to speak? You know, did you find information on that? Yeah, so it's interesting because most of the primary source documents where we have Sarah's voice are letters to Thomas. So it's difficult because it is kind of only one angle of who she was, and it's probably a little filtered maybe. Um, but um, unlike Thomas, most of her education was um, self, uh, self-taught or taught by her brother to her, or, or Ashley Durant, for instance, um, at home. Um, so she wasn't studying abroad or traveling from city to city to meet with artists and um, have access to art classes and things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, and also I think at the time for, for women working in the United States um, as professional artists, um, the main priority still was to be at, at the house, um, taking care of your family and maintaining this domestic role. Um, so in some of the letters she talks about um, many disruptions that she's being met with throughout the day as she's trying to work on her paintings, um, while also trying to provide company to her family members. Um, but uh, yeah, we also know that um, she did find community in, in working with her family, with Thomas, and then also um, doing drawings with her niece, Emma. Um, so I do think that there was this, some sense of community for her in, in the arts. Sylvia. Beth, I have a question for you. Um, has um, the midden, the kitchen midden, been found for the site, which is basically the garbage dump? Has there ever oh. been found uh, excavated? I, I don't think so. Um, I mean, it's, yeah, it's my dream that like the basement story is the next huge project on the site. Yeah. Um, but that space at the foot of the stairs will be open. Uh, I think it's open today for tours, so maybe some of you have seen it. Um, but we'll just have like that little area closed off with two doors. Um, Heather Palmer has been a really essential part of that. Um, but yeah, I hope I hope maybe in the future we can get some like excavation work and um, maybe even like an art. Jean Dunbar, 
Um, so it's super exciting and I hope you all um, get a chance to walk through it. Um, yeah, Sophia worked a bit on that too. You wanna say anything? Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that encompasses it pretty well. Uh, we also worked with Myra Armstead, um, who's at Bart, uh, who's been pretty, really amazing. Um, and yeah, the making of certain archival material public also has been really satisfying because in a lot of instances, the only things we have are these documents, like four or five documents to a person, if not less. And so a big part of these installations is the reprinting of these manumission documents, which issued freedom for you know, these inventories where just a trace of a person is kind of uh, indicated, but it is what we have. And so um, I'd implore you to look at those documents closely when you're in the space. Um, you had a question right back there. Yeah, I'd like to like, like to thank or continue to thanks for such impressive and important work. Um, my question is a little bit disciplinary and a little bit about future interior, which is that the, the marginalization of figures in art design and construction continues. I'm thinking like your stories of the, the creation of a place like Dubai, the impacts of, of, uh, of uh, certain Pakistani uh, workers. And I guess I'm trying to think like as, what can we do as, a, as designers, builders, artists to leave a better record for the future? I mean, it's one not to marginalize and to, to currently People. But I'm like, as you know, you're talking about four documents. Like, what do we have to do better now so this doesn't continue? Because I, I have a feeling it is still happening. So I, it's an unfair question, perhaps, but you guys can <laughs> see it from such a perspective, from the perspective of the, the archive. Like, how can we leave better archives? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I, 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 I wish I had an answer. Sorry. Printer <laughs> emails, right? Print your emails, yeah. I mean, archives are really, I, I worry about archives a lot right now because we do have all these like, amazing letters and things that we can reference now, but I'm like, emails, it's like, whoosh, whoosh, deleted, gone. Like, what, did you, what do you all think? Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, I mean, one thing is that, you know, um, I feel like research projects are so important. The activation of archives is so important. Um, also, just the acknowledgement of different forms of labor, even if they appear, um, Kind of minuscule. Like I, I love to see on like a website or a project the names of people who contributed to to it. Whether it's you know an installation, it's a building, you know it's a written project. Um, I feel like that's a really nice way to to kind of remedy that. Uh, like when you're looking at a building, who are the people who have constructed it? Like even down to the sort of um, yeah the manual labor involved in, in an endeavor like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, you know, if you can, like, support blue collar workers always, and um, yeah, I, I think it goes further than that. Like, advocate for um, worker better better wages for blue collar workers, um, and uh, know that even on our site, you know, um, it's it's not just like an arts. We have an amazing grounds team. Um, I see Paul in the back, um, and and you know it's important to bring in everybody in almost like every aspect of, of your team. So yeah. yeah. Can I say one thing? You know we have a whole part is you know about hidden stories. <laughs> this is this is just. This kind of blows those out of the window, I think. I mean, I think if whatever is gonna happen, you know, in another part of the house that gets developed, we've already got the hidden story theme built into the house, and, and these people deserve their, to be heard. And I think it's a, it's a really good idea. Hudson. All right. Um, I, first of all, I just wanna say, uh, all of this makes me wanna know more about these people. It's about the best thing I can say. That's obvious. Everybody kind of feels like that. But uh, particularly Josephus, uh, what I am, I, I kind of lost track of the times and the dates and everything. Um, he survived Thompson by many years. And I think he 
you said he ended up in Athens, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what happened to him in that injury? Was he emancipated and did he get a work or what happened? Yeah, yeah. he's free. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, you know, there's so much speculation, of course, because we don't have a lot of records of him. You know, uh, Sylvia was really important to me in the research uh, from the beginning to end, as were so many people. But um, yeah, Josephus is manumitted um, in 1818. And uh, then the United States goes through one of its first really huge financial crises in 1819. There's like a banking crash. Um, so, you know, there's some speculation that he would have struggled financially um, at that point. The only skills he really had were in the caring of, of a person like Thomas Thompson. He didn't have a trade, you know, he wasn't a blacksmith or anything like that. Um, so, we know that in 1820 that he appears on the census, at least, you know, nothing is 100% certain, but the name Josephus Thompson appears in Athens. Um, Sylvia was able to kind of find that out through the names of other uh, Athens uh, you know, occupants and residents. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, from there, it's all sort of speculative, but it would have been difficult to live as a black individual right. at that time, of course, with the kid, you know, the kidnappings that you see in articles. And, you know, there are still abolitionists organizing in Catskill. You know, Catskill actually was kind of a, a pretty good hub for abolitionist activity. Um, you know, when prominent abolitionists were doing tours of New York, they stopped in a few places in Catskill is often one of those. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, e even with that, you know, it would have been a struggle. Well, so to that point, would he have been a potential um, target for slave hunters coming out from the South? Because, you know, as a free man, I, we've all seen 12 years of slave. I'm just curious if he would have been in the same position. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we see a lot of, uh, yeah, records of the Hudson River being this, you know, really strong channel. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry. Say that again? The vigilance committees that were, that were um, part of the abolitionist meetings weren't just to advocate for the abolition of slavery yeah. in the United States, but also the vigilance committees to sort of like, you know, sound the alarm, like, you know, yeah, if, if there was a, 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 a known federal marshal or somebody showing up, you know, it's not good news. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, yeah, it was common practice, I think, for, for free black individuals in Hudson Valley you know, to be kidnapped and then sold back into slavery sure. uh, you know, down south. Um, you know, so, yeah, I mean, and people are, there are also, like, really prominent names like uh, Martin Cross, an abolitionist and a barber who lived in Catskill, um, and several other figures. John John Palmer, I think, wrote an article about it. A lot of people have uh, done research on this figure, but, um, yeah. One more question in the back, and then we can let's keep talking. We can uh, really, I think we can just keep talking. Um, thank you so much for your um, individual presentation and the important stories that you're bringing out. And do you have plans to take your research and bring it to school groups that might come here, like a younger audience than sort of all of us that are sitting here, <laughs> absorbing all of this and bringing it out to make it available? visits here or in schools? Yeah, um, so this upcoming May 8th, um, we're getting a school group from Catskill High School, a um, participation in government class, and we'll be kind of walking them through the new displays on labor in the home, um, specifically I think because they, they address a lot of um, legislation that was about slavery in New York at the time. So um, yeah, I'm super excited for that and to kind of just hear their honest feedback. Um, but otherwise, I, yeah, we've, we've totally changed our tour script for this season and it's going to include um, a lot of these topics. And, and Do you think that yeah. people come here whether they're adults or adults in particular, they come here to speak that they're gonna hear just about Thomas Cole and his art? and um, the importance of incorporating a more complete contextual story about it. Like, I think museums are, in general, I mean, not so much just here, are starting to do that important work, but um, the expectations of audiences might not be ready to receive equally. I don't know. I feel like that's, so Lisa, you have a question. Yeah, just one thing. I, I, you, your, your work is so important for us because, I mean, it, uh, 
this house was, uh, the property was developed 21 years or more than 20 years before Cole moved into it. That's a lot of time. Mm -hmm. We need to know what you've given us and I think our visitors do as well. And then look, look at the, uh, uh, Sarah Cole really gets into gear when Thomas Cole dies. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the rest of the story. So you've fleshed out a much bigger picture than we, we've been too focused on Thomas Cole and the, you know and and what he brought to the house when he moved in in 1836 but he only lived here really 12 years it's a much bigger story and thank you so much for uh, broadening the you know for filling out the picture for us and I know there's a lot more work to be done but you each have done just a marvelous job we all want to know more and thank you for for, um, for giving us this wonderful introduction to the bigger picture. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming today. And um, just to answer a lot of the questions, all of the research that the fellows do with us over the years gets integrated into our displays and into our exhibitions and into our educational initiatives. We put them right into what we're doing. These are not um, research projects that sit in a binder on a shelf. We're actually doing it, so please come and visit. Um, our next opening will be on May 6th, and we'll be debuting Living Reframe American Landscape. And you'll be able to see not only this giant exhibition recentering women in the history of American art, but also a lot of the new displays and initiatives that our co-fellows and our amazing staff and board have been working on over the year. So there'll be opportunities to know more about Mariah Cole and Sarah Cole and um, the Free Black Women. So you have to come to the house on May 6th and join us for that. Thank you all again. Have a great afternoon.